Welcome back, my dear, dear friends. And straight off the bat, I'm going to ask you to do me a little favor, okay? After you've finished listening to this one, I want you to go back to the start and listen to it again. Trust me, the second time round it's going to sound like a whole different story once you know how it ends. Well, this one comes from the same author as the uh, Boston House basement story that I read you last week. So if you heard that one, you've already got some idea of what's in store for you. Little hints dropped here and there, which you're not going to pick up on, I don't think, until that second listening. Well, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And... Listen. I have 16 Facebook friends. Whether that is too many or too few is up to one's individual preferences, I suppose. But that's how many I have. I don't really know any of them. They aren't former co-workers, real-life friends, high school classmates, or the like. But that's for later in my story. Loneliness is dangerous. The human spirit will become desperate for contact. Regardless of how much we fight it, insist we don't like others, we were built to be social creatures. It's in our makeup. Nothing we can do about it. We will do our best to live isolated lives, but eventually we will crave contact of some kind. To do otherwise can drive one mad. We will starve for the connections we once had, or at least should have had. A lonely human will fill the emptiness with any number of vices. Some good, but some destructive. The individual will die a slow, painful death. But sometimes death comes quick if they are lucky. I was once one of the lonely. I detest people. Their ignorance, superiority complexes, lack of empathy. Quite frankly, most humans are disgraceful, self-absorbed narcissists. These factors alone made the pain I suffered through completely worth it. You see, I was severely injured in an accident. Due to this, I was awarded an enormous settlement, which allowed me to quit my job, and basically move to a remote location. I am now free of their droning on about their weekend, or kids, or whatever it is they feel the need to share with me. Therefore, every day I suffered with injuries was worth the ability to get away from society. My money is not in a bank. I took the settlement payout in a lump sum and closed my bank account two days after I left my job. I drove halfway across the country. I packed enough provisions to allow me limited contact with people for a long time. I now live so far into the wilderness that the only time I see other humans is on the rare occasion I go into the nearest town, 43 miles away. I have no family at all. No children, no siblings, no parents, no aunts or uncles that I know of, not even an ex-wife. I have no friends. I have not had a real friend since sometime during high school, many years ago. I can't recall the last time I dated, nor wasted my time on dinner outings, afternoon coffee, or any other so-called social activity. Funny thing is, if you saw me, you'd never think I was such an outsider. I'm well dressed, some would say handsome. When I dated, I could easily pick up women who generally found me charming. I guess because, again, I had no problems in that area. However, one day I just realized the majority of people are not worth the trouble. My home is clean, nicely decorated. 
I'm not OCD about anything. So it's not like I'm some weird psycho that believes everything should be completely perfect at all times. I go without a shave on occasion. Let the dishes sit some days. So I guess you could say I'm just a normal guy in that respect. I left home at 18, never to return or speak to my parents again. I hated them. They were not bad people. But I hated them because I was alive. I was too much of a coward to kill myself and blame them for the life sentence of unhappiness. I only learned of their deaths after a private investigator tracked me down. I didn't care, but did inherit the home I now live in. Even the lawyers who handed over the paperwork had no clue where it was. When I stopped in town to ask directions, not a single person knew of such a home. That was music to my ears. It took me three hours to find it once I left town, which is, again, 43 miles away. My mother had kept the electricity on, so I left it that way. Less of me to trace. I don't know who will be looking for me. Eventually I'll get a generator. But that poses its own set of problems, so for now this will have to do. I don't receive mail. I have no need for it. I get the utility bills online and pay them that way. Even my email address is a fake name. I utilize the best privacy browser I could find. Being an IT guy, I'm working on developing one. Who knows where that will go? I can be lazy, but most days I scour forums, the experience project, Facebook and other places in search of one thing, friends. I have so many email addresses and online identities, I have them all in this notebook just to keep track. I have no idea why I'm even writing this, because no one will ever see it. I suppose the blank pages feel like talking to a bad therapist. They just sit there blank, waiting for me to do all the talking. But I digress. Shortly after I moved here and got settled, I did become a bit lonely. I hadn't realized when I came up with my plan that we do need contact with people. I'd taken for granted the interactions at the gas station and department store work, bank, and so on. All of those had been just enough to keep me from coming unglued, I guess. At first, I kept up with the news, watched illegal downloads of films and TV shows, but it wasn't enough. I needed to talk to someone. Going into town raised issues. One, I'd have to drive almost a hundred miles round trip find some place to meet people, then actually overcome my anxieties enough to start conversations. None of these sounded like an easy feat, so I settled on the internet. After I grew bored of typical mainstream media, the occasional porn site, I began to read forums. Forums for people with social anxiety, abuse victims, all types of forums for the sad and the weak, the outcasts of the world. In the beginning, it was just a way to bitch, vent and moan about how terrible people are. How bad we've been treated at some point in life. And then, something unexpected happened. Another user, Casey, wanted to be my friend outside of these sites. She wanted a phone number, email, Facebook friendship. At first I resisted. I didn't have a cell phone anyway, and I didn't have a Facebook account. But I could create that. I told her I'd do it just for her, because she really was kind, and we connected on some level. I didn't have any photos, so I searched Facebook for hours until I found a guy's page that seemed normal. Not too handsome, 
<laughs> average, I guess you'd say. I pulled a few photos off and made a page for myself. I call myself David Lewis. <laughs> Don't ask me where I came up with that name. I have no clue. So, in that instant, Casey and Dave became friends. In a week or two, I made up a few more fake profiles, adding them to my friends list. I thank Casey for helping me come out of my shell. We started talking every day. I liked several types of pages. Cat videos, jokes, movies, those types of things. My alter egos would like and comment, and I'd do the same. By this point, I was running about six fake accounts, which evolved into 15. But it didn't take long to jump back and forth throughout the day. I'd shared with Casey the fact that I worked from home, had no one, and lived far away from people. I didn't work from home, but it didn't really matter. I had to say something. Casey shared with me that she'd grown up in foster care, had no family and few friends. She had 12 friends on Facebook. Over time, I convinced Casey her few friends were bad for her. Not her real friends. I don't even know why I did it. It had never been my plan. But once I found her weak spots, it was easy to manipulate her. She eventually dropped them all. Why would I want to create more insecurity or depression in an already fragile person? I don't know. But it's what I did. Casey had a decent job in a dental office, but she complained of dealing with people every day. And then it dawned on me, neither of us had to be alone. I could have a lover, companionship at my leisure. I told her I had plenty of money, but never did I disclose I was now independently wealthy. You never know who you can trust. I told her I was gay, so she wouldn't assume we were going to live in some happily ever after. I wanted her to feel completely safe and comfortable with me, or this would never work. She'd been so easily manipulated, I knew I could convince her I'd suddenly become straight because of her, and she'd believe it. She was only 22, so her trust in people was still innocent in some ways, even though she'd been through so much in life. It was work, but eventually, my perfect plan unfolded. And as expected, she walked right into it. I convinced her to sell everything. When she said her car would never make the 1100 mile trip, I advised her to sell that too. Soon, she bought her bus ticket. She isn't a dumb girl but she is unbelievably trusting. I reiterated that she must tell no one where she was going or why. She agreed. A few weeks later, she arrived at a bus station some 236 miles from my home. I was taking no chances. She looks nothing like her photograph, but neither do I. We actually laughed about how, in some way, we'd both catfished one another. It seemed natural, normal, the instant we met. The fact we both lied had no effect on the way we got along. Once she arrived, we both deleted our Facebook accounts. We no longer needed them. We've had some fun times, actually. You'd be surprised how much having an actual person around has helped me and my mood. But now I'm ready for my solitude again. Yet, just sending her away won't be enough. I can't allow that. I can't do it. I've got to find a way to get rid of her. To really get rid of her might make me feel better. I've always had a bit of a dark side. However, I don't see what I plan to do as dark. 
She is a person who will never truly be happy or find peace. I can see it in her eyes, hear it in her voice. She is destined to live an insufferable existence. I can't help with that. She won't have to languish. It'll be quick, painless. She's a good person. She shouldn't have to drown in her grief and apprehension. I see it as a public service, really, what I'm going to do. She is a terribly broken person, and I understand that feeling. No one should have to live like that. If I send her back, what am I sending her back to? She has no job, no place to live, no family, no friends. And like me, she's too gutless to kill herself. I'll be helping her. And if this works, I could do it again and again. Helping people leave an empty existence that they are sick of living. I won't be cruel. I've studied painless ways to end a life. I know how I'm going to do it. No one will ever come here looking for her. There's no one to come looking, and they'd have no idea where to look. I'm in the clear on this. I think I'll do it tonight. I need to do it tonight. You see? This morning I found her under the tree where my money is buried. I can't let her find out about that. If she finds out about the cash I've got hidden, she could steal it, take off, tell someone about me. I can't have any of that. I never thought this would end in murder. I'm not sure how I pictured it ending, but not like this. However, now that I can see the pain I can ease in her, and others, I'm feeling quite positive about it. Here she comes. I'll close for now. Wish me luck. Six months later. It is against the rules to share the details of a case, but that's the diary of one Peter Alexander McMurphy. It was found on a bed in a large, beautiful home tucked deep into the woods. Hikers had taken a new path and come across a shallow grave, where we found the remains of Mr. McMurphy. He was easily identifiable once we located paperwork inside some drawers in the home. It seems, according to the details we discovered throughout the investigation, he'd taken every precaution to disappear but it wasn't difficult to determine who he was. The question we can't answer is who this Casey is. We found no trace of her or the cash Mr. McMurphy spoke of in the journal. We have no photographs, no traceable email. Facebook information has led nowhere. Forums are of no help to us. So here we are chasing a ghost of a woman. Perhaps a very wealthy ghost of a woman. Yeah, 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 I know what you were thinking. Who is this fool making me go back and listen a second time? I'm not doing that. Well, you might have just changed your mind, I think. Lots of little hints along the way that you haven't picked up on. But on the second listening, you're thinking, ah, okay. 
That all makes sense to me now. Well, I'm probably in England by the time you listen to this. And um, I'll be visiting one of the places where I encountered a serial killer. So um, I'll take one or two photos and post them over on Twitter. The same area, the same places, all these years later. Uh, if you haven't listened to my serial killer encounters video, why the hell not? <laughs> Alrighty, that's enough for me for this evening. Join me again soon. I'll be back with another tale on Friday for you. Till then, sweet dreams.